as I was praying through the uh, first reading today from the letter to the Romans, just this power of Almighty God saying, do you see? Do you see what needs to change in your life? Oh, uh, okay. Um, first, St. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. At times, do we get ashamed of the gospel? Do we hide from it? Do we believe it truly is the power of God? That it brings salvation. So often we think, yeah, I've been listening to the gospel all my life. Father, I go to daily mass, you know, and yet it doesn't seem to be changing anything. And yet the Lord says, this is, this is where you find salvation. Salvation comes from hearing the word of God. Then uh, we get into the second paragraph and it says, The wrath of God is indeed being revealed from heaven. And I was thinking about how um, the wrath of God is not just an Old Testament thing, just like the mercy of God is not just a New Testament thing. Uh, and we look and we say, okay, these, these are uh, ways of understanding how God is loving in our midst. What is the wrath of God? It's not that God gets into a snit. He gets angry with us and says, okay, I'm going to smite you. Rather, the wrath of God is the love of God as experienced when we cling to our sin, as opposed to when we cling to Him and His mercy. And we'll see this a little bit later I'll get in the, the passage, I'll, what this might look like. But the wrath of God is not God saying, I want to destroy you, but rather is God saying, I want to bring conversion to you. Uh, and so then it goes on about how God has made himself evident to the people who reject him. He's made himself evident from, from the beginning of creation. Ever since creation of the world, his invisible attributes of eternal power and divinity have been made, have been able to be understood and perceived in what he has made. That we can tell God is. That there is one creator God by looking at the world around us. Certainly there were some Greek philosophers who were able to pick this up even, you know, in the centuries before Christ. So it's not just like something that, that we look at now. And, you know, a lot of times this, people say, well, the more we learn about science, the less we need to learn about God. But there's actually a bell curve for that understanding. Um, as I heard this described this way, that People who really don't know much about science, they're able to believe in God because they don't know all about that. But then, like in the middle, there's all these people saying, I know a lot about science and I don't need God. But then on the other side, the really people who know everything about science, you know, like into the high details, much, much smarter than I am, they, they look at it and say, yeah, there has to be a God. <laughs> by, by, you look around, there has to be a God. I remember um, someone describing it this way, that because of the way that the whole universe is set up and specifically the way the earth is, the particular tilt, the distance from the sun, the, how much oxygen and other uh, uh, things are in the air and that there's water on this planet, etc., etc., etc. The fact that there is intelligent life here on this earth, the odds are so incredibly small, infinitesimally small, that for there to be other life in the universe anywhere is virtually impossible. But if we believe in God, of course there can be other life out there. God created it. God could have created those circumstances. But if it's all just a random act, we're it. There ain't nothing else because there's no chance just, uh, just by there being chance that there could be anything else. And to think, God made us. He made everything just right for us to exist. And when we look at the incredible gift that there is life, uh, the highest level scientists look and say, yeah, this isn't something that just happened by evolution or like that. This is something that had to have been created by a, an intelligent mind. Now, we can't get to know God without his revealing himself to us. But there's so much that we can see in creation where we can say, there is a God. And so St. Paul says, they have no excuse because God has revealed himself through creation, through nature. And although they knew God, they did not accord the glory as God, him glory as God or give him thanks. Their hearts were hardened. Their hearts were hardened. Instead, 
they became vain in their reasoning and their senseless minds were darkened. That when we get hard of heart, when we give in to our sins, when we, we then have a darkened intellect and a weakened will. And we're not able to recognize God's true presence moving in our lives. They, be, they claimed to be wise but became fools, exchanged the glory of God, glory of the immortal God, for the likeness of image of a mortal man or of birds or four legged animals or of snakes. Basically, talking about idolatry. What's this talking about? Well, of course, uh, at the time of St. Paul, he was surrounded by the pagans who um, worshipped all sorts of different uh, gods in the pantheons, etc., whether it be Greek or Roman or so many other places. But also in the scriptures, uh, they make reference to their God is their stomach. Not that they worship their stomach as such and put it up on an idol and make a sacrifice to it, but seeking after carnal pleasure as an end in itself. You think about the Roman practice where they had the, what are the, whatever they call them, the vomitoriums, where they would go and eat and eat and eat and they enjoyed eating so much, then they'd go and vomit and then go and eat and eat and eat some more. Because they just enjoyed eating so much that they made their God, their stomach their God. Or other place, um, they make reference to uh, the idolatry of greed. And we look and say, it doesn't mean that we necessarily have to worship at an altar, but when we put other things in the place of God as our one thing that we seek in our lives, first and foremost, they become idols. And this is where I was talking about at the beginning of my homily. It was like, uh, okay, I need to work on this. Here's areas where I need to tear down those altars in my life where I have put things above God. And so then, therefore, God handed them over to impurity through the lusts of their hearts and the mutual degradation of their bodies. This is where the wrath of God thing I was talking about at the beginning is now coming up. God's wrath is not, I'm going to smite you because I hate you. But he wants our conversion. And when we harden our hearts, he doesn't say, okay, I'm going to take away everything you love, but rather, you want that? I'll let you have it. You want that so much? I will let you have it in superabundance. I'm thinking about uh, Bishop Sheen saying, oh, I can imagine a hell for, for gamblers where all they do is play cards for all eternity. And then he, there was no reaction. He says, you'll get that on the way out. But um, much like here. Uh, but we, we look at this and why? Because when we go after something other than God as a central point of our lives, as what will fulfill our hearts, what will give us comfort, it ends up leaving us empty. And I can see this as God saying, okay, you're rejecting me? I will give you over to the impurity through your lusts of your heart and the mutual degradation of your bodies. You think it will bring you happiness? You're going to find how empty it is. And would that in that emptiness then you come back to me? that you may come to my heart and come to experience my love. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and revered and worshipped the creature rather than the creator. And don't we see that so much in our culture, maybe even in our own lives. And the Lord is saying to us, come back to me. Come back to me. I want to fulfill your emptiness. I want to fill your longings. I want to be your comfort. Too often, though, we look for the things of this world to be our comfort and our satisfaction. So we turn to the Lord today in repenting, saying, Lord, <laughs> thinking about St. Peter as he's walking on the water and then he falls in, Lord, save me! Asking the Lord, pull us out! Have mercy and pull us out of this mire that we find ourselves in. Help us to break free from whatever addictions or habits or, or patterns where we go after the things of this world, the pleasures of this world as, as idolatry so that we can worship you first and foremost and above all things, Almighty God.